Tonight we're going to um, learn more together about grief, bereavement and loss. Um, but that's from the point of view of um, what we bring to this meeting as much as anything else. So it should be a space in which you can take this opportunity to raise any questions, comments or issues that you want to share and have Margaret, Margaret here. Margaret Nemosne, we're very grateful for Margaret being here, uh, to run through with us because there's a lot that we can learn from, from Margaret and I, I want to begin by thanking Margaret for agreeing to join us again because she has joined us in the past. What, what we have here is a new project and the idea is that everybody needs care when they are or everybody should be able to receive the kind of care that would be appropriate when they are bereaved and it would be helpful therefore to understand as much as possible about the issues within the mental health community as well as bereavement and grief and loss issues generally. So we're in that sort of overlap between the two things. It's a peculiar place to be and we're learning all the time. Friends of Fullborn, hospital and the community and the chaplaincy of this mental health trust agreed that we ought to try to do something together to help people who are bereaved within the mental health community. That's why we're here. We have a small number of loyal and committed volunteers who are already giving exceptionally good care to a small number of people, and we'd like to see that grow. And that's another reason for asking you to come tonight, is to promote that project, and to ask you to keep it in mind beyond tonight, should you ever meet someone that you believe would benefit from being referred to this project. One of the things that we do is meet and train together and tonight is a form of that sort of training session and we like to open it out to anyone and everyone who believes it would benefit them too, which I hope is why you're here. And um, we'll ask you who you are in a minute, <laughs> but I ought to also to say that we're recording this because there may be people who can't be here and who wouldn't be here who might benefit from hearing some of what happens here at some point in the future. So we intend to, with Terry's help there, Terry is with us tonight, who will edit it down to a, a nugget about 20 minutes long. We want to make a video recording of about 20 minutes length and make that available to others or indeed to yourselves if you want to go back over something that you've heard and th are thinking about. So bear that in mind. If you've got a question or a comment or whatever uh, in a little while that you'd like Margaret to turn to, make it a really good one, you know, because we, <laughs> we want to share it with other people. If you've got nothing to say, it doesn't matter. Don't feel any pressure. <coughs> so that's why the cameras are there. The camera's there. And we've also got a microphone because we want to pick up as clearly as possible what you ask or say, not because we need to amplify your voice. What a lot of rabbiting that was. If you need the toilets, out of the door, turn left, down the corridor. If you want to go out and help yourself to food and drink, do. But the plan is that Margaret and I have a little conversation for about 10 minutes. Then we ask you what you'd like to ask Margaret and we chart these things. And then it's over to Margaret to take us through the following 45, 50 minutes or so. It all began, I think, about 20 years ago. My youngest daughter had started school and I was looking for something to do. And he said, well, how about counselling? And I said, oh, yes, well, I'm interested in people. And so a marvellous coincidence happened. I was at our local greengrocers and I met an old friend of mine called Anthea Miller, who may be known to some of you. And I said something about, oh, I think you know something about counselling. And she said, yes, we're just recruiting for a <laughs> counselling course at Bottisham. This was the Adlerian training course. And anyway, I asked around a bit, and because uh, there are various different flavours of courses. Anyway, I couldn't really make up my mind, but I said, I thought, I know Anthea and I trust her, I'll do that one, and I haven't regretted it. And halfway through the course, 
I heard that there was a cruise training on and I was terribly keen to get out there doing some work. So I then opted to do the, and was accepted to do the cruise training. And I've been with Cambridge Cruise ever since. And I think, you know, it's such rewarding work. One of my best friends, um, her husband died of um, throat um, esophageal cancer. And I didn't have a lot to do with her, um, particularly as he was dying. But after he died, she would come around very regularly to my house about once a week and have a cup of strong coffee, which she liked, and then would just talk about her husband, uh, almost as if he was still alive. And I would just kind of listen. Um, and this was all before any of the counselling training at all. And so I think that was my first sort of idea that actually this kind of work can really help people. I mean, it wasn't work, it was social, and she later had a trained counsellor. What, what difference do you think it, could, it, it makes to speak and talk and share with someone like you when you're grieving? Well, I think it does make a difference. I was asked today, um, how do you manage to do the work? And I think the person asking said, well, you know, don't you end up crying with the, the client? And I said, well, occasionally somebody might get a bit teary. But the training helps so that you can really sit and be with that client and actually really listen. And for some people, that listening is the first time they've really been listened to in an active way without judgments or um, viewpoints coming in. So I think it's that opportunity to be independent um, and also with the experience of being with a wide range of people, you also have a wide understanding of the dimensions of grief, which can be enormous and very different in different people. So I, I think it's being independent and it's also for them, for the person, knowing that you're not going to collapse or be overwhelmed by their grief. Sometimes I say on training courses, the most important thing you can do is to be there and not be overwhelmed by their grief. If you can survive it, then somebody else can also survive it. I think that's very important. Now, it was really good that you took an interest in what we were trying to do here, you know, bringing together those, you know, the world of what you're doing and the world of men the mental health community and explore that bit where they overlap. What is there in this bit where they overlap that interests you? Well, having been a trainer with Cruz and yeah. a supervisor for quite a lot of years, I realise that there can be quite a fear amongst even trained volunteers about working with people with um, mental health problems. And it also became clear uh, because about 75% of Cruz's referrals come through GPs that we were getting increasingly complex cases. And this caused problems for supervisors and a bit of fear, I think, because, you know, is this too difficult for us to handle? Should we be referring on to other people? And this is really where my interest comes in, I think. Certainly pick that up sometimes here. Mm. Um, someone may be looking for uh, grief counselling, bereavement counselling, again, um, and it's just one of those things that goes round and round. Yes. And I hear that, well, there is cruise and cruise is available, but they won't go to cruise, you know, and it's all those yes. practical complex yes. things as well, isn't it, that yes. we're trying to, to tackle really together. Okay, so the other thing I was going to ask, when you talked about not being overwhelmed, what, one of the things I'm interested in exploring a bit here tonight is... Um, one of our volunteers was listening to someone and they very quickly, uh, well, she very quickly realised there was a lot of work to do with this person before you can begin to yes. help them with their grief. Have you anything to say to that? Just briefly, I know it will come up again. Well, building the relationship is so important. And I think the more complex the situation is, and perhaps if there are more complex mental health problems, you need a much longer time to build the relationship so that actually people, the client can trust you to actually really start to talk about um, what might be deeply 
um, troubling them. And so I think that that is one of the mm. sort of stick at it. As it well, were. yes, it's it stick at it. And at the beginning, it may not be very much about grief at all, maybe about all sorts of other things. But it's building that relationship so it trusted enough. So what would you do if you felt the fear? Kind of check out, first of all, is it my fear or actually am I just picking up the client's fear, what is called counter-transference. Mm -hmm. um, and as you become more experienced, you're always checking out um, how you're feeling. Right because it may be the client saying something and they may be kind of smiling and then you feel a deep, deep sadness. Mm. And that can be their unexpressed grief, mm. which is coming through. And then you might say very gently, oh, I'm feeling very sad now mm. when you say that. I'm just wondering how it is for you, something like that. Right. And he's just lost a very dear relative, not his mum, but I think his mum's mum. And uh, it's not it was actually a person that's died. In one case, it's the loss of a pet. So it was a very valued well, relationship. Multiple losses. <laughs> and because you know, sometimes in a way that simultaneously trivial, happens that the person may lose a, a limb, lose a person, many, many and uh, and also realize that they lose some abilities. It's useful to think in the stages of grief terms. I just wanted to know or if that's do you now deal passe? with only those you know? Or can you counsel a total stranger? How do we approach people with completely different cultural backgrounds from yours? Um, and I always find it difficult to know how to deal with them. I mean, my, my instant reaction is I want to hug them. Obviously, that's not really PC these days. Um, so is there any correct things you should or shouldn't say? I mean, that's an interesting question about counselling a stranger or not. Uh, with my cruise work, it would normally always be counselling a stranger because actually if we know somebody or have a connection, then we wouldn't actually be doing the bereavement work, not under the auspices of Cruise, because we know them in another context and it's not an equal relationship. However, many people who've trained in bereavement work actually may be using their skills in the workplace with um, colleagues um, or indeed with their family or with their friends. But in that case, you're kind of using your skills and I'm also thinking that perhaps you're thinking because you work on the ward and you actually know the people, uh, is this a possible thing to do? And I would say, yes, it is possible to use bereavement skills, but you can't have quite the contracted relationship that you would have if you're doing either bereavement support with crews or grief counselling where it's much more structured and it would normally be between people who are kind of strangers. And the more the population learns some bereavement skills, the less reason there will be for organisations like Cruise to exist, hopefully. I mean, that's one, one. And it's a very important mission of the work, really, to educate the, the population at large as much as we can. Yeah. And uh, thinking about cultural um, diversity, uh, this is a very broad question. I would say, first of all, that all people are different and all people grieve in different ways. And then on top of that, you've got what is happening in the family and people within the same family are often and usually grieving in different ways. And this can cause great distress within the family and somebody feeling, well, you know, you obviously don't care as much because you're not grieving the way I am. You know, I'm, I'm crying all the time and, you know, you've g gone straight back to work or you're busy on the fundraising project. So there are many different ways to grieve. And one of the things that's really important, I think, is normalising what normal grief reactions are. And as I say, there's a very wide range. And also to help people understand that just because somebody in their own family is acting differently, it doesn't mean that they're not grieving really, really important. And then, of course, beyond the family, you've got the work situation and whether grief and, and bereavement is actually accepted at work or allowed. You know, is it a kind of bit of a to taboo subject? Don't really want to go there. If somebody has died at work, will the firm actually support the other workers by allowing them to go to the funeral? 
which I would always recommend to a, a company. So there's that context. And then, of course, there's the cultural context that somebody comes from and the different religious aspects. And, of course, it's impossible or very difficult to know a lot about a wide range of uh, different religions and exactly how they might handle the ritual around funerals. But I think the, the easiest and the wisest thing to do is to be kind of upfront about that and actually say, I appreciate you come from a different culture. Please tell me you know, what happens and how it's all managed. And of course, not to make the assumption that actually all these customs are okay for the individual. They may be, or it may be that uh, some of the customs bring difficulties. For instance, um, women not being allowed to Orthodox Jewish funerals, and I believe to um, um, some Muslim funerals as well which could be difficult, so. Well, probably not a hug, unless you know them very well. <laughs> uh, because actually we never know quite if we don't, if they are strangers, we certainly don't know what effect a hug would have on somebody. It might freak somebody out completely. So I think a very simple thing is to say something like, you know, I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, and then, leave an opening, if you like, if they want to talk about it, um, depending on how much time you've got. If you're doing more kind of admin -y things, you may not want to or have the time quite. But I think it's just about being open and kind of acknowledging. And then if they want to talk, they will say something. Uh, but if they're there for fundraising, then it might be good to engage them because they're probably doing that or will be doing that because of the loved person who's died. So, and that, that's a good link between you, I yeah. would say. And is there anything you say to stay clear of? Well, um, you know, time heals and um, I don't know, within the room we can probably come up with quite a few of those uh, sort of cliches or, you know, it will be better soon or, um, I don't know. Could be worse. Could be worse or... <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, oh yes, I know yes. how you're feeling. That's a yes. That really should be avoided because we can't ever know entirely how somebody else feels. We can have a guess, mm -hmm. but we we can't really know unless we're that other person. And I I think the main thing is not to ignore it. Mm -hmm. I used to be in a big non-audition choir, and one of the prominent members of the choir died. And I remember my person I always sat next to, who was, she's um, much older than me, and I said something about, oh, I understand so-and-so has died. Um, I was going to ask her about something. And then my companion said, oh, no, 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 you can't ask her. She's bereaved, you know, mm. as if life doesn't go on. People have to do normal things as well. And actually making it so that the bereaved person isn't kind of contactable or is not helpful either. It's a bit like the person who says, you know, I say, how are you getting on? And they say, well, I went out shopping in the, the local co-op and somebody I thought was a great friend of mine, she disappeared down the other aisle, you know, because she didn't know what to say is, is probably the, the answer to that. And she was so embarrassed that she thought, well, make a quick exit. But that is incredibly hurtful for people when that happens. So the best thing you can say is, you know, how's it going? You know, something general or, you know. And I think it's all right to say it's okay to cry. And you can also say when it's on the phone, well, perhaps after a little bit, take a deep breath and, you know, and then tell me a bit more about what you wanted to say on the phone, you know, something like that. So I think the main thing you know, it's for us not to get overwhelmed by their feelings and you must have a lot of feelings that you're picking up from the people you're dealing with. So I hope you have somebody and you both have somebody to support you as well because that's important. So yeah. that's a key message as well then, that mm. look after yourself. Yes, mm. absolutely. Yeah. Yes, this was Peter, really. And, and, and Peter, I think you, you were making a point about 
trying to be helpful to people who are living with mental health challenges as well that you know about before something like this might happen. So there's a pre-bereavement stage as well, which is another interesting issue, Margaret, isn't it? Um, it's quite within the scope of normal grief. You know, at the beginning, there is a kind of um, numbness and then there can be um, great sort of emotional feelings once you've got over the kind of numbness stage. And I think you mentioned that this was a grandparent who died. Now, it's interesting, within crews, over 50, I think it's about 50% of the referrals are actually about a parent who's died. And we also have a significant number of people referred with a grandparent. So it's not a, an insignificant death. I mean, no death is insignificant anyway. But if it's been a strong relationship, then it's more likely that there will be quite intense grief. There are other factors as well. I mean, it could be that there are mental health problems and so this person is more vulnerable and perhaps more emotional because of this. Um, I'm just trying to think what other factors there might be at the moment. Um, was particularly if there's a, as I say, there's been a very strong attachment and particularly with the parent, if it's almost been that the, that the person hasn't kind of detached. And of course, sometimes the parent is a carer for um, a person and that leaves an enormous hole, as it does in reverse. If the person who is bereaved is a carer and then the person has died, um, similarly, that leaves an enormous kind of hole in the person's life. And so one of the things one might be thinking about a bit longer term than the kind of short term intense reactions is helping them. Sometimes they might need some kind of practical help, but also help in kind of reorientating themselves because it's, it's also a kind of existential problem. Who am I now in the world that my mother has died or my, my grandparent? You know, even if my grandparents had lived a, a good innings and, um, you know, died a, a quick death or something. Mm -hmm. And even if I've perhaps known that they're going to die, but that, that doesn't seem to necessarily make any difference to the intensity of the grief. And, of course, the, the other factor is what may be called in modern terms resilience, I suppose. You know, how resilient is the person to coping with loss? And, you know, I had a question over here about loss of any kind, uh, of different kinds. Has the person actually had losses earlier in their life which they have coped with? It may be that there's been early losses which haven't been well coped with and therefore they get triggered off and this is more difficult. So it's like a compound effect. A compound, yes, yes. I remember I lost my mum last year and I remember having the odd moment where I think, oh, I've forgotten. I'm supposed to be in grief, aren't I? And a bit of guilt, you know, that, yeah. that kind of thing happening. Mm. So is that this, are the rituals part of healing the person up, you know, part of the therapy, or are they part of their marking remembrance of the, mm. of the person that they've lost? I think it's a bit of both, actually. And I think in the past there were a lot more rituals than there are nowadays. I know in the Greek Orthodox Church, they still have rituals where they mark, I don't know whether it's one month, then three, then six, then a year, and they bake special cakes, things like that. So I think, you know, if it, and that it's also embedded in the community, so the whole community is also remembering, which I think can be helpful. Because one of the difficulties is here, you know, people are perhaps allowed three months to grieve, and then after that becomes this thing about, well, surely you should be getting over it a bit by now. Yeah. And then everybody else is beginning to forget. So I think those community rituals can really help in that respect. And I do also appreciate your comment about, I I've, I've, have forgotten about, you know, my mum this minute because I'm enjoying myself or out doing something. And that guilt that goes with it. And I think there can come a stage when 
people perhaps if a partner's died they're kind of ready to go out into the world and perhaps do some different things but then that guilt hits in oh I'm being disloyal you know if I go out and and one of the things is to encourage them that actually they're not being disloyal in fact I was talking about it to somebody today uh, about how the person who died you know if they were sitting there with my client what would they say they'll actually want you to go out and really live life to the full not to forget them but to go out and live that life to the full as, as well and I think that that's a kind of healthy journey through grief if you're able to finally do that and feel that actually because life is so precious then I need to live it and not be in kind of perpetual withdrawn Stages. I mean, do we still bother with thinking about stages of grief these days, mm -hmm. as, as was asked? Yes. Or what? I yes. mean, do I know when my grief's over? Well, that's a big one. Some of you may know about Lois Tonkin, but she was a New Zealander. Uh, can't quite remember anyway, healthcare professional. And her idea, and I, I will come back to the stages and phases and tasks in a minute. This is the person's life and at the beginning when they're grieving the grief seems kind of all encompassing. Yep. And the expectation is life stays about the same and grief shrinks. But what she observed and I think is very helpful in this context, is that, well, I hope grief gets a little bit smaller, but that actually life grows around it. So that, in that sense, it's not about getting over your grief, but actually finding a kind of reasonable place to kind of put it so it's kind of remembering the person in a happier maybe healthier way but at times it will be a very sad way particularly on anniversaries and then also when you get kind of caught out uh, I had a, another example of that just today um, person saying oh I was in a new situation and um, I had to wear some safety clothes and I was sort of, um, or, or I wasn't allowed to do this and um, so I challenged it and then the boss said, um, oh well if you don't do that I'll have your mother after you um, for health and safety and of course the person didn't know this was a totally insensitive remark because this person had lost their mother. So there will always be these little things that kind of catch you out when you think well, I'm doing okay and then you, you end up in a situation where somebody refers to that. Sorry, I've gone off at a tangent there, but I hope people find that kind of helpful. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the few things that I might actually draw out for a client because it's quite liberating to them to know, well, I'm not expected, well, I might even make this slightly bigger still, I'm not expected to lose my grief. It's kind of okay that it will be there and that heartache, I mean, if you've lost a child, then that heartache will be there till you die, I think, a little bit. So even if there are other children or other, you know, happy things happen. So it's, I, th I think it is a very helpful way of explaining it. Um, to get back on track about stages and things, personally, I find words for tasks quite useful partly because it's kind of about movement. But a big caveat with any of these things is not to think of them as linear. Yeah. So there's the, the stages, Kubler-Ross's stages, and Murray Parks had phases, which are pretty similar. The stages were really based on her work pre-bereavement as founder of the National Hospice M Movement in the USA. Um, Oh, See you. what we're looking at? Yep. Oh. yep. And I think because each person is different, one or other of these frameworks may be 
useful in thinking about it. But the caveat is, please don't expect people to grieve neatly doing all the four tasks or all the five stages you know, in those orders. And then actually to be saying, well, I don't think you're doing your grief properly because actually you haven't done word and second task properly or even third. And in actual fact, task number one to accept the loss can take longer than both of the others, which is, is very interesting. And it's partly because accepting the loss is also about this existential problem. Who am I now that maybe my parent or my partner has died? How do I readjust to life without, the, without that person? How do I describe myself? I mean, my, my sister died um, 10, 11 years ago now. And do I describe myself as one of five or one of four? It's interesting when somebody asks, well, how many siblings have you got? So, you know, how, how, how do we cope with these, these things? Uh, the Margaret Strober dual process model is a very useful one. And again, it gets away from this linear idea. The bit I haven't put in is the oscillating line. So we have loss orientated and restoration. And I don't like the terms terribly because they're a bit sort of technical or something. But the idea is that the beginning, you probably spend most of your time thinking about the bereavement. And so you're on this side. And then, well, you've got to do some kind of normal, everyday kind of things. So you actually go over here. But then you rapidly go back here. And then the idea is over time, you spend a bit longer over here. And then eventually you spend more time over here, but you still go back to there at times. So it's this kind of oscillation. And so it's spending some time focusing on the grief, but other times getting on with life or doing something more kind of practical. And that would be a kind of very healthy uh, sort of chart, if you like, for somebody. And it can describe over a period of time, a long period, like weeks or months, or it could be you're doing that during one day. And that's how it, it works. So I think that's quite useful. So you can put your oscillating line in, if you like. Um, on the back, we've got Tony Walter's model of bereavement as biography, and I had the privilege of hearing him last week at the cruise conference. So this is about a sort of narrative approach, which can be quite helpful to people perhaps um, working in healthcare or um, kind of related professions where you're, you're not really doing bereavement work concentrated, but actually listening to the story mm. would be quite helpful in all its different forms. And then Martin and Doka, and again, I had the privilege of meeting Doka last week, a wonderful American. Uh, he wrote a famous book called Women Don't, Men Don't Cry, Women Do. But actually, he's written tons of other books, and he's a very uh, jolly um, little American, also a, a minister. So there we go. And he had uh, talked about grieving as intuitive pattern, which is really mm. the emotional expression, an instrumental pattern, which those of you who are fundraisers uh, would recognize, people who actually put their energy into doing practical things. And there's a slight bias towards women doing the first and men doing the second, but not necessarily, don't make assumptions. And some people do a bit of both. So, you know, all things are possible. And then a um, guy called Nehemiah, who um, this is really the kind of constructionist stuff, I think it's called, and existential, making new meaning. Um, from my Ardlerian background, I've added the priorities, attitudes to life. And this may affect the way that we actually mourn. So if we have a controlling attitude, 
I will not show any feeling, and I will keep everything as normal, make it go back to work as soon as I can. This is all talking still within kind of normal grieving. Significance, my grief is greater than yours and nobody understands it. And I had a lovely example of that where I was working with a woman whose father had died and thinking about rituals and the grave. It came to Christmas time and they wanted to put something on the grave. And mother said, oh, well, I'm going to put so-and-so. But the daughter said, uh, no, um, oh no, perhaps it started the other way around. Mother said, uh, daughter said, I'm going to put some hellebores on the grave, uh, Christmas roses for those who are gardeners amongst us. And mother said, oh no, no, I'm going to put something else. And the message that came over from mother was, it's my grief, you know, he was my husband mm. and I know best. So, and so daughter felt a bit disenfranchised because I think the other, whatever it was, one out. There we are. Um, pleasers, they'll be busy, so busy looking after everybody else that they won't attend to their grief. And they're the kind of people you maybe see after nine months or a year because they're kind of exhausted and suddenly collapse. And avoiding. These are people who might find it far too stressful to talk about the bereavement anyway, so less likely to see those at least initially. If you're working with someone with a mental health problem, so my friend who suffers from depression or anxiety, and you think the cat's going to die and it will be a complete disaster, can you find a way of improving resilience? You know, Peter was talking about when the grandmother died, it's as if he thought she was going to live to a thousand. Um, but I'm interested in whether, if you already know someone's vulnerable, you can do things to help beforehand to make it easier to cope when you know, there's an inevitable loss. And what will, will build up their resilience, given that because of their mental health problem, you can kind of see it coming, that they're very vulnerable to... Um, to being massively affected by the bereavement? I think certainly talking about it beforehand, if you know it's going to come. I mean, obviously, if, you know, the cat's getting elderly or yeah. granny's getting elderly or unwell, then actually talking about it. And we're not very good in this country normally about talking about this kind of stuff at all, I think. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know whether other people would agree with me. Sometimes, sometimes even because the way that people are talked about or even the animal is talked about um, in the process is as though, um, you know, with the right care and the right um, treatment, you would, you would live forever. So there's a, there's a problem with the, with the, um, physician letting go if you see what I mean as well as the so it's difficult to prepare someone when when they're always being offered the next thing to bring that person back as though letting go of that person is the very very worst possible thing and I think it is a difficult one because if you do it wrong then the person feels that their loved one is abandoned so it has to be done with huge care um, but, you know, pr sort of uh, pushing on and assuming that there's always a rescue to be effected uh, does mean that it's very hard to prepare yourself for an inevitability. And I think it, that's even worse in, the, in America where, the, you know, there's, there's a sort of sense of failure if a person dies uh, rather than a sense that this is, there is, a, this is a good span even, even when it, they've had a good span. I wanted to build on that because before we started this evening I, I, I might have said something similar to what had just been said namely that one of the issues is that in life we don't deal with death but actually one of the thoughts that I've come away with particularly from the diagram that you drew is that actually I now feel that death is not necessarily related to grief because you have uh, drawn grief within the life 
of an individual and that I now mentally feel that even if I was better with dealing with death in life, that doesn't necessarily prepare me for the onset of, of grief. But where there may be some positive in all of this is whether if collectively we dealt with death more openly, we might be able to distinguish between, in helping others who are grieving between, as it were, admitting that somebody who is here has died and being able to talk about death and therefore approach the bereaved with, without necessarily addressing their grief, but at least addressing them. And also I wonder, you, we, we tend to talk about grief as being internalized in the individual. You, we've talked about families where there's joint grief. But those of us who are young enough remember this mass phenomenon of the death of Princess of Wales. Uh, and uh, at the time, I was cynical and didn't recognize that as genuine grief, but as some sort of collective hysteria. Sorry, I've let a lot pour out here, but I wonder whether there was something here that you, know, that you could build on. Well, it's interesting about the collective grief, because in fact, although it seemed a kind of new phenomenon, in fact, it's very old. And there was some famous prince in the 17, early 17th century, I can't remember who was the heir to the throne and died, uh, aged about 18 or 19. And apparently they had a whole week of celebration and, or not or mourning in London. And I don't know, I think that's probably a flotilla on the Thames then. So, you know, it's, it's historic. Um, it's a real puzzle when it happened, though, because yeah. I'm not a royalist at all. Yeah. Um, and I felt remote from all of that royalty and all that but when she died and that stuff started to happen i felt caught up in it it was a real puzzle i think um we experience that quite a lot with sudden deaths you know it feels to me as if this summer i've read about a number of um shocking deaths there was an accident in little like downham happened. wasn't yes. there um car this is road accidents mostly and there was there have been some teenagers and i think the community does then rally um, but I was going to say, I do think funerals are, are helpful and almost regardless of how distressed someone is. Um, so I've had the experience with older people who have dementia, um, where I'm burying the, the partner who's better. And we have the discussion about, are we going to get granny out of her um, residential care situation to come to the funeral and will it be distressing because it's all unfamiliar and will it be you know maybe physically taxing depending on her condition and will she know what's happening and that sort of thing and I'm massively for trying to get these partners to the funeral because my experience has been they always rise to the occasion you know, they, they always more than you would um, anticipate know what's happening and behave um, appropriately. And I'm sure at some level, the music and the flowers and what's happening is emotionally helpful to them, although it's an upsetting thing and the family are thinking they're upset enough already or, you know, they're already struggling with life. <laughs> this would be an extra thing. I think it's very helpful. And I think that's probably the case with um, maybe some other people who are inpatients. If, say, sadly, there may be a suicide or something within that community. I'm thinking about anorexic um, sufferers at the moment, where that's quite common. It is be I do think it's better for them to to be part of that grief, although it's distressing than to be cut off. I, yes, I think you have a good point there, because I was thinking um, somebody who worked with somebody who um, was hospitalized, and the, um, I can't remember what relative it was now who died. And there was this kind of feeling of disenfranchisement because they, couldn't go, they went, couldn't go to the funeral. And somehow 
they couldn't start grieving until kind of long, you know, much later because of this, and and were very sore, I, I suppose, angry about not being able to go to the funeral. So, um, yes, I, I think you're probably right. It's it's better to allow people the opportunity to go than not. So. Yes. Um, when my husband's father died, he was in his 60s, but his mother was still alive and in a residential home. And they never told her that her son had died. And um, so therefore, she, every visitor she had, she complained that her son never came to see her, which seems very sad. And she was demented, so she might not have taken it in or remembered that he died, but at least I feel she should have had the opportunity to know and be part, I, uh, and maybe it would have been more real if she had been able to go to the funeral. Because in the mental health world, we've been talking a lot about recovery, you see. Recovery and um, building a life or getting your life back, getting mm. your life back on track and all those things mm. and coming to terms with loss and figuring out who you are and what your life's about. That's going to be the key yeah. instrument, I think, isn't it? The people who are there for you need to be tuned into that, mm. I guess. Yes, I think so. And, you know, particularly when there have been multiple losses, and, you know, maybe some people have lost a, a parent in childhood, and that can sort of start off if it's... And often in the past it wasn't dealt with very well. And I think, um, you know, people then travel through life with a... Um, you know, something unresolved. That's probably slightly the wrong word, but yeah. yeah. And then you have more losses on top of that, and maybe another bereavement. I mean, one of the things I would say, I think, in working with people with mental health problems, if it's a recent bereavement, I would say that they will probably go through a kind of normal grief process at the beginning, and then it kind of depends what happens after that. And it depends also whether it does trigger off the multiple losses because those might be the ones which are very difficult to talk about, where you really need that long relationship building for them to be able to kind of surface. I, again, about pets, yes. I would say pets are very significant. I mean, Cruz doesn't actually deal with pet bereavement, but unless it's part of another bereavement, but it can be very, very significant. Thinking of somebody who lost their horse when they were a teenager and you know, completely destroyed their life for a time. Um, you know, horses, dogs, cats, great companions. I mean, you can talk endlessly to them and they're not going to talk back at you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. I think that's a good place to end because it is a form of loving that we're offering, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Being there for the other person. It takes courage as well, I think. I think you're very brave to do what you do for others when you're offering this kind of love, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing I've heard tonight is you shouldn't do it on your own. Mm -hmm. don't, don't leave yourself on your own um, in, in committing yourself to someone else. And that's important, too, to look after yourself. But, um, well, we've gained such a lot from your sharing with us, Margaret, and we're very grateful for what you've shared with us. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>